In this episode, David and Kate talk about a game that is not a Zelda game, but it certainly wants to be. David and Kate played Beyond Good and Evil. Hello and welcome to another episode of another Zelda podcast. Kate, I stole it from you again. I, I just gonna, noticed. I was going to say you stole it from me. When you looked at me. You're welcome. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, for that little <laughs> bit, that clever little bit of uh, of wordplay. Yes. Another episode. I'm a genius. Of another Zelda podcast. I think I was just so charmed that you said it so much in season one that I've accidentally picked it up and put it into my lexicon. It's like the official opening tagline now. I think it might be. Honestly, mm-hmm. it might be. Uh, so, Kate, how are you? Good. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Today, we're recording on a Sunday evening, which is very uncommon for us right now. But mm-hmm. I had to move some schedule stuff around, and you were very gracious, and you're letting me wedge this into your schedule to record this episode, because you actually had a really busy day. I did. I've had a busy weekend. I am currently performing in a local community theater production of Lost in Yonkers. Indeed. So I had a performance today. I had one last night and one on Friday night. So you're doing this at the end of an opening weekend? Is that what we're recording this episode? Correct. Anybody who does theater knows that usually what you want to do after opening weekend is just lay down. Yeah, but it's the opening weekend. It's not as crazy as the next two will be. Um, The next two weekends, we have five shows each. Right, right. Um, You've done this before. We have done this together in a play, so you remember. Um, So yeah, the second and third weekends are always the crazier ones. So this weekend, not too bad, That's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, I, because I was also going to joke for our magical sword patrons that are watching this episode right now that you came camera ready in full makeup. Yes, and luckily I don't have too much old age makeup. Actually, like pretty much none. Actually, <laughs> how old shows is your up. character supposed to be? Like older thirties like, or forty, yeah. and so we don't try too hard to age her because no. you I just mean, frown a lot while I you're just, on stage. <laughs> yeah, I just look forty anyway. So completely it's untrue. Not a, much of a stretch. No, I don't think it. I don't think it matters. I yeah. am on stage for ten minutes oh, no. out of a two and a half hour long show. Oh, so. Even if my face doesn't look exactly 38, it's okay. I see. Well, today (laughs) is we're doing our first ever sort of review episode of a Zelda game that is not a Zelda game. Yes. I'm really excited to talk about it. I just wanted to I wanted to bring it up real quick here that today we are reviewing, quote unquote, we're having a discussion about beyond good and evil. Yes. Um, I do have some listener feedback. Cool. Uh, How do you what do you do? But I wanted to ask, too, what do you do for those first that first act or two that you your character's not out on stage yet. Yeah, I don't go on until after intermission. So do you play Zelda on um, your Switch? Um, I do have my Switch right now because um, Switch Online just released some Super Nintendo games. I am. Are you doing a those. link to the past? Mm, not, yet. not yet. Right yeah. now, I've been doing Super Mario World because I, that game holds a very special place in my heart yeah. to the point where I could probably like speed run it. I see. Not anymore, but I used to be able to. So I'm playing that one right now, but I'm almost done with it, actually. And then I think I will go back to Zelda. Well, let's speak about A Link to the Past real quick, because it is scheduled to be our season finale episode. Yeah. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that. That's still maybe five episodes away from now, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll probably be reviewing it in late November or mid-November, but the episode will come out in December. That's always what we do at the end of the season. We stack a few up right at the end so that we can actually have our holidays. Mm-hmm. But... um. Um, I have started playing A Link to the Past fresh. I know we started it Ooh. over break, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went in new and fresh, and I'm actually playing it on the SNES, the SNES Classic right now. And okay. I chose that because I honestly wanted, I'm playing it up on the TV, mm-hmm. and I kind of wanted the um, the CRT filter on so that it felt like the pixel art was how it would appear gotcha. back on an old CRT screen. And I'm also using that little color changing filter. So that kind of dynamically, as you might know on the Super Nintendo Classic, there's an f- option where you can have the background subtly fade uh, the colors of the whatever would be the black border on the side to oh, whatever think... the re- like most used color is on the screen or the average color or whatever. I think you've mentioned that once before. I did not know that before you mentioned it. It's kind of nice. It's better. It's nicer than just like square in the middle of the screen. You know, it's, it's kind of nice. I, yeah. I do like it. So I've been playing well, it that way <laughs> and I'm going into it with fresh eyes and fresh hands and <laughs> it's okay so far i'm like i'm i think what i've i promised myself going into it because this is well now that we're going to be playing this over the next couple months mm-hmm. i promised myself to play the game the way it wanted to be played not the way i wanted to play it 
Because like it's for me, it was always frustrating that I could only map things to the Y button, and uh, some of the ways that Lynx literally swings his sword was frustrating to me. I preferred the Lynx Awakening way and stuff like that. And so I'm just kind of going, let it be, and play, and I'm enjoying it. I'm probably going to do the opposite of what you're doing, which will come as a shock to anyone that's listened to any of our episodes. <laughs> well, we do hate we, each other. We yes, that is also true. <laughs> and then we also do things completely the opposite. Uh, Usually after we finish recording, we just start punching each other a lot. Wow. Um, so, you know, secret behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Camera so, ready. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I was thinking about it, whether I was going to completely start over or try to start from where I was. I do remember liking the beginning. I mean, spoiler alert for that episode. And then just getting frustrated as it went on. But right. so. I was only a dungeon or two in. So starting over was fine for me. I made a face uh, yeah, for anyone con- watching the video because this uh, laptop is going to die. <laughs> so you're going to lose your notes? Are you okay? Uh, no, my notes are on paper. You can I use my iPad if you need or anything. Lose. If you need to Google anything. Okay. Uh, I can't lose the Google. Let's do this. Uh, I'll give you the iPad uh, if if we lose it. Um, but I'll do some listener feedback right now. Cool. Let's do that. Here you go. Knock your socks off. Thanks. With that situation, with the little iPad mini and the uh, tiny t- tiny I, little keyboard. I guess I don't hate you so much anymore. It's a cool little situation. Tiny little keyboard. I can't type on this tiny little keyboard. Logitech made a case that is a case for an iPad mini, and it also has a keyboard built into it. And honestly, I love it. I go everywhere with it. But beyond good and evil. Yes. Everything okay over there? Yes. Typing is yep. difficult. Got it. Beyond good and evil. Oh, no, no. Listen to feedback real quick. Oh, my gosh. We got to get into this. We got to get into this. I think we're a little bit lax because it's like a Sunday. Oh, no, we're only six minutes in. We're fine. So (laughs) let's do some listener feedback on our Water Dungeons live episode over on YouTube. Cool. Audie said, Twilight Princess, my favorite again. The boss looked epic, and I love the music, even if it was uh, easy all 15 times I've killed it. Mm -hmm. Um, The boss? They're saying the boss was easy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that... that I mean, it's the fish boss. Remember, it's essentially just hook oh, yeah, shot, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then it's more like a cut scene, but it is a really cool, fun thing. Yeah, We were so speaking about that a little. We were. I remember, yeah, the boss isn't necessarily super challenging, but it is very cool looking. So I, I hear them. I hear them. Mm-hmm. We have a highlighted comment over here. The, the otaku artist uh, said, this is my favorite video of yours. I'm so impressed. I can't believe that you guys only have 300 subscribers. I can't wait to watch more of your videos. I agree with the Epona thing completely. I feel like there should be two categories for companions, though. Story partners. Oh, this was our uh, favorite NPC off our favorite NPC episode from a while back. Okay. Um, story partners. Mid no-, no, maybe it wasn't that. Maybe it was sidekicks. Sidekicks. sidekicks uh, episode three, season two. Sidekicks. I feel like there should be two categories for companions, though. Story partners. Midna, Fee, Navi, etc. Um... Uh, and speak, speak much more about... Okay, wait, wait. My favorite story partner is definitely Midna, and adventure partner would be Epona. I see where, where this person's going. I get it. Uh, one character you guys didn't bring up, though, was Marin. She's a huge part of Link's Awakening, and I feel like she could fit in the story partner category, even though she doesn't offer tips. If we were to make like a story partner and a mechanical partner, mm-hmm. I would totally put Min- Marin in there. I think that's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For sure. Otaku Artist, thank you very much. Here is a iTunes review. Let's see here. Uh, Kill for time. Great engaging podcast for both expert and casual Zelda fans. Kate has left the studio. She's going to get something. I think a power cord for her computer is what's happening right now, which means she's going to reject my iPad mini, I am guessing, because the keyboard, the typing was too much. There's a lot of behind the scenes for a not behind the scenes episode, Kate, right now. Uh, so anyway, uh, MJ Kuhn. Oh, MJ Kuhn. Uh, her and her husband, I think, they've really kind of become friends of the show lately. I don't know if you've seen them, but they're very active on our Instagram account and stuff, Kate. But let's see. Uh, she says, great engaging podcast for both expert and casual Zelda fans. I'm a newer Zelda fan. First game I ever played was Wind Waker. And my husband is an old school fan who has been playing since basically the beginning. Of- <laughs> Kate is running around the studio Here right I am. now. I'm back. Well, that was the most professional thing I've ever seen on a Shut podcast up, ever. <laughs> um, so MJ Kuhn says, um, both of us were entertained enough with this podcast to, to survive a 20 plus hour road trip straight through the night. Been a big fan ever since. Keep up the killer content. That's insane. Cool, right? I wouldn't listen to me for 20 hours. I think they binged us a little bit. <laughs> they both like Zelda for different reasons. And um, M- MJ 
Kuhn's husband, who also has, I think, Kuhn, K-U-H-N, in his last name of his handle mm-hmm. over on Instagram, yeah. they uh, they chime in all the time these days. It's it's really a lot of fun. Cool. They're like podcast family. They're becoming podcast. They're certainly podcast friends right now. Aww. Um, uh, perfect podcast. Over on iTunes. Here, we got another one. Rosetti19. Someone, oh, as someone whose dogs are named Lincoln Zelda and <laughs> is a huge retro gamer, this podcast was exactly what I was looking for. Thank you so much. And I'll do one more uh, iTunes review, and then I think we'll get into the show here. Okay. Amazing! <laughs> Mind Fool said, really loving this podcast. Every discussion has substance and heart and really draws me in. Allows me to nerd out to my heart's content. Keep it up. Substance and heart. I, that, I'm touched by that. That's really nice. I would consider what just happened in this episode to be full of substance, which is me and heart tearing around my house looking for a power cord. You know, it's interesting. I think maybe we do tend to, we don't really like cut in this show if nah. something has to happen. But that was, you really just winged it there. I for mean, someone who doesn't like improv, that was, a, that was a bold choice that you just made, Kate. Desperate times. Call for desperate measures. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So... Let us do this. Let's start talking about Beyond Good and Evil. Now, I cool. did play Beyond Good and Evil when it came out uh, back in the day for the GameCube, mm-hmm. 2000 something or 2003. other. 2003. Oh, wow. You've got, you have more information than I do. Actually, my page that I had loaded just didn't load. So 2003, I played it on the GameCube um, when it came out. It also was released by, it was released by Ubisoft. It was a French developer mm-hmm. and it came out on Xbox, PlayStation 2 yep. and GameCube, I believe. And PC. Oh, it did later come out on PC. That's right. That's right. And mm-hmm. then I think you played it though as an HD re-release yes. on PlayStation 3. Correct. Um, I don't have as many like concerns about playing games the way that they were originally intended. I know that's how you like to play them usually well, okay. like on their original format. Um, but I just saw that in the PlayStation store and I thought, well, you know, an HD remake will probably allow me to enjoy it more mm-hmm. nowadays. So I went with that one. And actually I did a little bit of research on that HD remake and it is more of an HD re-release. They didn't change anything about okay. the gameplay. Um, basically, it just runs at 60 frames a second and at uh, 1080 resolution or whatever, instead of like the four 420 that it was back on the CRTs. Gotcha. And I, they must have obviously changed the uh, oops, my, my mic, the aspect ratio to fit mm-hmm. on a widescreen TV. So you, maybe you were privy to a little bit more panoramic views as you were hmm. going around in your hovercraft yeah. than I was. But um, other than that, we should have had almost identical the same experience. They didn't change how the buttons work or anything. Cool. Yeah, I, th- I feel like we may have discussed that when I was looking around to see which version to buy. Oh, yeah. that sounds familiar. So I played it in super low res Mm -hmm. RCA to an HDMI adapter up and onto my TV. And that did, at one point, that was difficult. And we'll talk talk to that when we get to it. Oh, yeah. There was some difficulties. Oh, really? In terms of gameplay. Let me start first. The reason we're doing this is because maybe once a season we'll review a Zelda-like game. Mm -hmm. This game did come out after um, Wind Waker, but I think before Twilight Mm -hmm. Princess. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And it also came out after another Zelda-like that I've mentioned many times, Star Fox Adventures. Mm -hmm. Star Fox Adventures came out very close to, but I think technically after Wind Waker. So if we were to talk about all four of those games, it goes Wind Waker, Star Fox Adventures, Beyond Good and Evil, Twilight Princess. And the reason I mention those four in that order is that, in my opinion, there is an evolution of the sidekick in all four of these games. Mm. We were just kind of speaking about that in in, uh, in customer service, I almost just said, (laughs) in listener feedback. It's weird. That's my job. (laughs) It's customer service. Um, um, Navi in in, uh, Ocarina Ocarina of Time, actually, which even predates that, was just the little flying icon. We've talked about that. Mm -hmm. And I will speak more to that in a future episode that I am titling Zelda 64, which will be a making of... Ocarina of Time episode. Yeah. Can't wait to do that. I've been putting a lot of fun notes together for that, Kate. But that one's probably still three or four episodes away. Um, then we had kind of no sidekick, but it was the boat in Wind Waker. Mm-hmm. And um, they replaced Navi with actual arrows that would just point at characters and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Fine. <laughs> but after Ocarina happened, I think a lot of other companies were inspired to try to do the what we'll call sidekick mechanic character. Mm-hmm. The first one was a little Stegosaurus, Triceratops. Triceratops called named Prince Tricky, uh, who would follow Star Fox around or Fox McCloud around in Star Fox Adventures. Okay, and it was very, technically at the time it was very impressive. It was the first time because Navi, they just kind of map her her vectors to 
go lock on to a bad guy and come back. She doesn't have to make like contact with the ground. She doesn't have to be an NPC, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But Prince Tricky, the Triceratops, had to walk on the ground. They had to make sure that he wouldn't clip through trees or stones and all that kind of stuff. He had to be aware of his his, his environment, even more so than a normal NPC, but not quite as much as the playable character. Okay. While Rare Studios was making Star Fox Adventures, this company... Uh, something Mo- something Montreal or something, but essentially we'll say Ubisoft, but it was another company which I'll look up. Um, they kind of went, an- they w- took it to another level, and so Paige the pig and also that other character, that army guy, mm-hmm. um, they basically are the Navi of this game. Yeah. So to dive in here, so I just wanted to point that out that it is kind of cool to explore this kind of sidekick thing. Yeah. Um, borderline co-op with those characters, but for you first responses or first reactions as you were playing the game what is the most zelda like or how do you feel that zelda or even ocarina specifically inspired this game the most as you were playing it what were your impressions Ooh, okay so i mean can should i go straight to the ending of the game and then spoil it because that i think is a big part of why it reminded me of zelda well, i never expected in a million years that you were going to say that let's do it yeah <laughs> but, i mean we always kind of every episode we basically go into it spoil like you we've assumed you've played these games and right. things like that so yes spoiler alert i mean well i can't okay. believe we're jumping there let's do it well there are a couple things so there there's i guess first we can talk about like the the form of exploration mm-hmm. in this game so there's a little bit of open world stuff it's not super extensive well like the the light, the sea the ocean is kind of hyrule field right and it's a little bit like wind waker that way right and then there are you know quote unquote dungeons you know you go to the slaughterhouse you yeah. go to the, the factory the factory right, there's um, another one um, you go to the moon. Um, you go to these little hubs that then you do further puzzles mm-hmm. within. So that's certainly similar. The control um, is very similar. There's no jump button. Um, it's kind of context sensitive if she can jump to things and grab things. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say there's, she kind of jumps, but it's like a roll that... Oh, there is a like there's a, a roll button, roll. isn't there? Oh, yeah, there's that dodge. It's essentially a dodge, I think. Yeah. It's like a jump roll, yeah. It's odd and... I accidentally too, pushed B so many times coming out of that camera. I would oh. I would come out of the camera by pushing B and go straight into a roll animation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways. Um, what else? And then, well, so what I was mentioning before about the very end is that basically it, it reminded me of like a Triforce kind of situation where she has this power inside okay. of her and they have to keep it inside of her because then, um, you know, if it gets let loose, the ultimate enemy will use that power to destroy the world and i was like well this sounds familiar (laughs) um it was just very like well that sounds just like link and ganondorf you know they have to be come together for the enemy to become super powerful and to finally rule the world the way they always wanted to and Um, so Shawnee, on and so forth. Shawnee. Which, by the way, where did that name come from? Do they talk about where that name she gives it to herself as like a she does code name i thought i thought wasn't that her code name it is but i didn't know why they like, well i know she needed to have a code name so that her actual identity could be protected because she was doing all the undercover photography and the reporting right so that was like her handle but i don't know why the big alien was calling her that right I or was, maybe she was inspired to use that name and it was deep inside her from this other experience that she didn't and she didn't maybe she just picked that name you know what i mean and i don't think it's explained because i remember looking that up later and being like where did this name come from and yeah. i didn't think i found an answer i mean if, if y'all listening know the game better than we do please let me know but um but anyway that was just like a side question mm-hmm. that i had was where did that name come from um but then yeah also definitely the the sidekicks were a part of it um and i didn't not like the way that the sidekicks were used yeah. i like that you could you know press a button and they would help you out. That was certainly helpful, but you could still keep playing while they're helping you out. That mm-hmm. was cool. They didn't like really interrupt the process. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, what do you, what do you think? Why or Let me freeze my uh, alarms here? I'm so sorry. How rude. Um, you guys, Dave is so popular. No, 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 it's not. Oh my God. This is becoming a bit and I don't want it to. It's unprofessional for the show. <laughs> Um, oh, I need so to start but me running to the other room for a power cord was totally professional. It's like a loose episode, it's a loose <laughs> episode. But um, um, for the, when I remember when I first played Beyond Good and Evil, 
and I certainly was aware of these things on my second playthrough, immediately I was like, oh, this is just someone else doing a Zelda game. Mm. Um, because the way the item selection was very, very similar, the idea that there isn't a jump button, that you're basically doing an action-adventure game, um, the combat, it would kind of auto Z-target for you, yes. but it had Z-targeting. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember loving this game very much the first time I played it being incredibly impressed with it but i was coming off wind waker and wind waker had its own style i also Mm -hmm. liked wind waker but i remember so i do prefer twilight princess to wind waker i do prefer Mm -hmm. the aesthetic of twilight princess to wind waker i don't need super awesome graphics always but when the graphics can further immerse me into an experience i get very excited about that and twilight princess did that for me before twilight princess existed Beyond Good and Evil did that for me because this is a beautiful game, especially for its time. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, also, the camera element is very, yeah, uh, especially with Wind Waker because you have a sort of camera. They don't call it a camera in the game, but right. yeah, you have a camera. So And it controls exactly the same with the C-Stick, at least on a GameCube controller. Mm-hmm. And one of my notes is, oh joy, a camera mechanic again <laughs> with sarcasm. It's not perfect. No, but I ended up enjoying it further. Like once I you know, was taking pictures of the animals and everything, there was a point to it that was actually oh. useful. Oh, you mean a literal camera. I thought you meant the game camera, but yes, oh, both of it. Both. No. Let's go both. Yeah, yeah the, the camera that she's using. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at the Wikipedia page and it's like, like on the cover of the game, like apparently it's that important that she has a camera. Well, she's a reporter and actually it is that important because the way that she triggers her things is by taking pictures. Every single thing that she needs to accomplish instead of like, oh yeah, I did like that instead of just grabbing an item or grabbing a gem or grabbing an instrument or whatever, which is often the case in Zelda and that's fine. Mm -hmm. This one, they kind of made it a little bit more story related and it was a little bit more contextual. It was, we need photos of X, Y, and Z. That's right. And that's mechanically the same as go find the gem. But I did kind of like that it was a little bit more in the world and and in their world that made a lot of sense Mm -hmm. instead of just needing five magic things. I guess I found that part forgettable (laughs) because I remember taking pictures of the animals more than taking pictures of the, you know, the enemies, whereas in the you know, dungeons, so to speak, whatever you want to call them, the levels. I remember the like stealth elements and yeah. getting around more than the picture taking. A tremendous amount of stealth in this game. Yes. Um, almost two thirds of it is stealth. A lot more stealth than I remembered. And I know you alluded to this in a previous episode, so let's just jump to it. We can do characters in a minute. Yeah. Um, the stealth is a bit different. Uh, on the surface, it feels like Zelda stealth where you're just trying to not do line of sight. Mm-hmm. But there are, it is a little bit more robust in this uh, game and I think it is also a little bit better communicated and gives you some forgiveness. What was it like for you? Yeah, normally I do not like stealth stuff, um, which I have talked about before, like the Yiga Clan stuff and and Breath of the Wild right. drives me up the wall because mm-hmm. it's also very difficult. This one was at times very frustrating because the enemies would just kick your butt so much like if they if saw you, you, seen, you were you like pretty dead. much couldn't fight yeah right um although there were times when i when i was able to defeat them and mm-hmm. i felt very proud of myself yeah, it was once or twice for me too when in you know stick blazing because mm-hmm. no guns um but i i didn't hate it that much it was manageable mm-hmm. um i got through it i didn't recall any kind of particular moment being like oh you had to do a burger ah! like, i thought the, the fact that she kind of auto clings to the walls and the ducking was really nice. Mm-hmm. And I thought they did something really, really smart is that when you would push up on your camera button, instead of looking up, it would pan up to give you a better view. Mm. So normally a camera would, you know, just turn its head or pivot around, right. but it would actually move up to show you things instead of just look up. And that was brilliant. I think that was a great choice, honestly, for the camera. I, I did like also that you could like shoot the guard's um, yes. air. Yeah canisters on their backs mm-hmm. and so then that would trigger another one to come over and like try to help him and then you could get that one and you could chain them along so yes. you didn't necessarily have to only sneak right um i mean you could do it several different ways you could just sneak around you could just go in there not sneaking at all and try to defeat them mm-hmm. and kill them or you could like kind of shoot your little discs at their um, air canisters and try to like distract them that way. At their air canisters, you can shoot the discs at buttons and then they'll go try to fix the button. Yeah. You can even shoot them just at the wall and they'll be like, what's that over there? Mm-hmm. And they'll go look. And so there are four or five different ways to do many of the rooms. Um, I think each room, I felt like the the stealth, it's basically in the slaughterhouse house and the factory, I believe. Is there's yep. a lot of stealth in both. Yep. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. And I was fine with it. And it's also kind of cool that if you're spotted, 
and you run away far enough, I'm sure you encountered that weird laser robot. Yes. That's basically the version of reset. If you can get away right. enough, they're not going to start you all over. They're not going to necessarily like kill you or something. If you can manage to run away enough and hide, oftentimes hiding in those little sewer things, just yep. break your line of sight from the robot. Yep. You see the lasers and they go all clear and you're like, okay, cool. I've reset. I get it. I get it. Slap on the wrist. They Let's forgot, try it again. They've magically forgotten that I was ever here. How well, convenient. What I like about it is that they're assuming that you've been extinguished or whatever by those lasers. Right. You know, which is kind of cool. I mean, all of, if all of a sudden they hear another scratch on the wall five minutes later and they are immediately like amnesia again. Right. I get it. But <laughs> I like that mechanic. I thought it was very, it, so it was unforgiving in that the fighting them was difficult. Yes. I think the few times I did, I also had the army man with me and I would use his super action for him to ram them mm. and I would do some distractions, but mm-hmm. we'll talk about characters. Like I said, in a second, even though we normally lead with that. Um, um, but I actually had an issue with the camp, with the camera, the photos a few Same. times. Okay. I had an issue with the non photo camera, the game camera, <laughs> the game camera. Let's talk about it. Um, it was just very challenging. I, I kept wanting to manipulate it in a way that it would like refuse to do so. Okay. Um, you mean like it was inverted and you wanted it to be not inverted or was it more complicated than that? I don't know. I just felt like I got stuck, you know, trying to get the correct camera angle that Mm. I wanted. I think it still goes behind her back if you push L essentially, like, like it does in Zelda. Mm -hmm. It'll auto go behind her. Um, the... I, oh, let's talk about the dynamic camera. So there's many times in this game, and it only happens once or twice in Wind Waker, where the camera will choose like a dynamic, a very cinematic angle. It'll pull way back, or mm. it'll it'll show from a certain angle. Um, it'll show the gameplay, and you'll stay in gameplay. That was a very, very, very new concept when this game came out. Oh. The idea of kind of mixing cutscene style visuals with gameplay. Sure. This is one of the first games that ever did that, honestly. So I remember being very taken with that back when I first played this game, Mm -hmm. that they were bold enough to give it a try. You see a lot of that stuff more. This game predates all the Uncharted's, of course. And we have have actual Uncharted style levels in this, like when she's running away from the bad guys over the rooftops. Yeah. I mean, I I mean, Uncharted took all that from I mean, this game was one of the first to do it, honestly. Okay. Which is very cool. I did write down that I really enjoyed that part, and that may be why I am a big fan of the Uncharted games. Yeah. Like, I kind of have been thinking about playing them again, mm-hmm. honestly, recently, if we still own them, which I think we do. Um, I've only played Uncharted 2 a bit, and I liked it. It was fine. Oh, I've yeah. I've played all of them except the newest one. I got to pick up the newest one. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, uh, that was... There were definitely moments in playing this game where I was like, oh, I did not see that coming, like that rooftop chase scene. Yep. Um, or like a random kind of laser obstacle course, like, yeah. oh, okay, I wasn't exactly seeing that coming, but that's pretty cool. Um, so there were certainly parts in the game where I was like, oh, that's what, a fun surprise. Oh, yeah, when the game jumped people, jumped players into the her, the part where she's running away on the rooftops, maybe yeah. uh, two thirds of the way into the game. Yeah, when when players originally played this game, it was it blew our minds, and I know it did for others because I read reviews at the time. It was like. Oh, I'm still playing. Yeah, because b- before that we were we were in the Resident Evil Four stuff almost, where it was. I mean, Resident Evil Four came out a little bit later, I think, but it was like you play and you watch, you play and you watch, and the idea that you could have cameras that are much more like watching. Also, they do a cool thing right off the bat, and they also do it in the the rooftop chase scene mm-hmm. where the game will just dramatically go into slow motion, but oh, you're yeah. still playing in yeah. slow motion. That happens right off the top of the game when you have to fight those doms right in the beginning. What was that experience like for you? Just when you when you started the game, what were your first impressions? Well, you warned me about it. You're like, because ah. I was talking about how I don't love games that kind of start putting you in the thick of the action and they don't really allow you to have a learning curve. Right. Luckily, this game is not particularly challenging right. in difficulty in my mind. Yeah, the combat is pretty easy. Pretty easy. So I was prepared for it because I remember you'd saying that and I'm like, eh, here we go. And I was like, oh, that's not that bad. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's cool. And then... It goes into slow motion to make it more dramatic. Mm-hmm. Like, it is cool. And then once you <laughs> get that done, you're like, okay, cool. And then you can explore right. and relax a little bit. So yeah, I didn't mind that. It's almost like a little... Um, it's almost a cold open almost, you know what I mean? Yeah. I like she's doing her her yoga and stuff with the, the characters. The, mm-hmm. the actually individually rendered leaves and stuff was really kind of cool. Yeah. That the, those graphics are happening in this game. A lot of atmosphere effects in this game. A lot of smoke and fog and lighting yep. that um, was very, very new at the time. Hmm. I mean, volumetric fog exists in when you go to the pedestrian market or the... It's not the pedestrian market. What's it called? District. Pedestrian yeah, pedestrian district. district. Um, 
there's volumetric fog on the ground that that you walk through. And when your angle changes, you can see the like mm. kind of mist. And that was bonkers new at the time. <laughs> the way they did it back then is they would just load up certain levels of like see-through sprites. Mm-hmm. These days, there's actual math. Like in Mario Odyssey, the volumetric fog is like actual uh, calculations now, mm-hmm. but they faked it back then. And there's a lot of volume faking. The, uh, the lights in this game all have, uh, are all radiating off of like a misty type of atmosphere and air. That's all just um, flat graphics that are mapping to where the camera is. It's all a trick, but it's cool that they did it. They mm-hmm. really pushed this game further than what certainly the GameCube could do for a lot of these things. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's stuff that I would not have even thought about, but I like that you do. Um, oh yeah, because yeah. it it makes me think about stuff that I would not normally have maybe paid attention to. Um, did you feel I couldn't help but get a lot of like Fifth Element vibes while I played this game, the movie Fifth Element? Yeah, and I haven't. Have I seen that? I'm obviously aware of the. What movie. did I don't you know just say? I've, yeah, I don't think I've seen that. I know what it is, and I know who's in it, and I know the vibe that you're talking about, but I have not seen the movie. I haven't right. seen a lot of movies, you guys. I'm going to have like to lot. leave. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I That's fine. I guess. You. I just guess go. you and I are just, just go, enough Dave. difference in age that for me it hit when I was in high school. That movie, and um, Dave is 55. 55 years and old. I'm 20. Yep. And uh, just kidding. Um, when the Fifth Element came out, it was a it was a big deal at the time. I mean, it still aged pretty well. The director who has gone on to make other films that are not as good. Mm-hmm. Um, but aesthetically and tone, there's a lot like kind of the the music, this the somewhat quote unquote hip music that's playing in a lot of the places. Mm. It's very this game's very French, and Fifth Element is also a French director, and like our kind of pseudo Back to the Future two flying cars everywhere thing. Mm-hmm. It all had, it came from a very similar headspace, in my opinion. I can see that. I can see that. Um, also, right in the beginning, um, I thought it was interesting that they, when you get to the city, they say, Loyal Hillians. And I was like, what? 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 Yes. Oh, right. Because it's called Hillis. It's called Hillis. H-Y-L-L-I-S or something. Yep. I never, rem- I did not remember that at all. I don't even think I noticed it when I played um, the first time around. But I want to point something else out. This was one of the first games, truly, that also had in-world audio happening. So when you first start playing this game and you go up into her lighthouse house and there's a radio playing uh-huh. and it gets louder and more quiet. as It's it's located in the world and it's giving you narrative and stuff like that. Um, having people just randomly talk as you walk by, yeah. that was all super, super brand new when this game cool. came out. Cool, so cool. in that way, this game really immersed people. Yeah. It was very dense, and it really immersed them into this world. The world ends up not being tremendously large, unfortunately. It seems very small. Yeah. The city seems very small. Like There are only so yeah. many things that you can do there, and it bummed me out because you have to go there a lot. When you first go into the city, you look around, you're like, this is amazing. And it's all smoke and mirrors. There's really like, you can go to some races or you go to the pedestrian district and that's it. And that's it. Um, yeah. You can maybe go to like the the bar or whatever it right. is. Right, yeah. Um, you can subscribe to the newspapers, which I did. I did too. Um, that was a cool thing I thought was the little messages that would come through. I, the emails? Yeah, the emails. Mm-hmm. I was like, every time I got one, it was not an annoying thing. Like... It was not overly done or overly used. I'd be like, oh, ooh, I have a message. Oh, okay, yeah. let's check out the message. What I did not like was the discs and how you had to save in the game. It was clunky. It was very clunky. It took a long time. It's like I use this to watch things, but I also use it to save. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I I get it. You know, They didn't want you to be able to save all the time because not every game is going to be like that um, magically. I mean, that's yeah. not going to lie. A reason why I really like Ocarina of Time because I could save whenever right. I wanted to. Right. Um, and why I had such an issue with Majora's Mask too because I could not save whenever I wanted to. I hear you. This um, was this came out at a time where save points were very much part of the language of video games. Mm-hmm. You know, this is early 2000s, right? Mid 2000s. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did like the email feature but anyway yeah then just wandering through the city i was like i want this to be so much bigger like i want more people to talk to it's a bit of a tease yeah like playing it now when i first walked when i first started playing the game remember how i told you um how struck i was when i went into uh castle town in twilight princess Mm -hmm. they're like oh i'm in a living you know world this is so great this is so immersive Mm -hmm. um i remember feeling that way about beyond good and evil as well a couple years prior to playing Twilight Princess, of course. Mm -hmm. I remember getting kind of excited about it. 
Um, the idea that I could walk past people and they'd just be having conversations was very, very exciting. But even when I played Beyond, even the first time I played Beyond Good and Evil, halfway through the game, you're kind of like, oh, this is starting to feel more like maybe just like a little play and not a living world. It's right. like, it's very small. There aren't quite enough people. And then right. when you, and and it changes a little bit when you go back, like there are more guards guarding the area and it feels a little more like, ooh, this, this place is becoming under control. Yep. And I don't, it seems like I'm not really welcome here, even though people are still walking around and there's like a, f a couple more protesters, right. but it doesn't really change enough to feel dynamic. Yeah, it is um, the f one of the first times that a, a situation like that would change. I remember right. the developers were really excited. They're like, you'll see the revolution affect the town and stuff like that. And maybe these days, by 2019 standards, you would expect that to be a systemic thing right. that's automated. Obviously, it had to be kind of scripted and performed. Right. You know, it's a bit of the Minish Cap thing. Every time you go back to the town, maybe it's a little different. Yeah. Or, I mean, even Ocarina of Time, you know, you go back to Kakariko Village that's and true. it's different the second time around. And then that's you, true. and then you, you know, save the town, so to speak, or, you know, you banish the enemy and then it becomes normal-ish again. And mm -hmm. so it was it similar in that vein where it changed a, it changed a little bit, but not a ton. Right. Uh, you get you get all the little shaped keys. I want to talk a little bit about the story, but I, honestly, I think we should go to break first. So let's come back and do characters and story. And then at the very end of this episode, did you know that there's a sequel coming out for this game? I've heard things. We'll talk about it. Cool. All right, cool. Let's go to break, and I'll see you in a bit. Okay. One of my favorite things to do when I'm perusing Instagram for another Zelda podcast is look at all of the amazing original artwork that's created by fantastically talented people. Now, we all have artwork or photos and images on our phones, posted to our social media accounts, but when you get that really perfect picture and you want to turn it into something real that you can see every day, posterburner.com can turn your photos and artwork into amazing prints. Imagine walking into your room and seeing that perfect family photo or vacation picture on your wall or even um, some artwork that you've created on the computer. I'm a graphic artist. I make stuff through Photoshop and Illustrator all the time. And it's really nice when you can take it and, and just and put something up on the wall that you can actually experience every day. I mean, if you need to get a gift for family or friends, there's nothing in the same price range that is going to be as impressive and meaningful as a custom print or piece of artwork that you've made. Posterburner.com is easy to use, it's affordable, and the quality is truly top-notch. They make amazing posters. And when I say posters, I don't mean those flimsy posters that you see rolled up in stores. Those are fine, but this is super thick premium photo paper. Did you know that you can get a 24 by 36 movie size poster for under $20 at Posterburner.com? If you'd like to show your support to another Zelda podcast, go to posterburner.com slash AZP today, and you'll get an additional 10% off your order. Now, that discount applies to every type of print that they offer. And that's not just posters. They also make premium canvas prints, metal prints, decals, stickers, banners, cell phone cases, and more. I actually went ahead and ordered a canvas print for some AZP artwork that I made, and I went with the uh, wraparound gallery style canvas to class it up a little bit. Again, you can go to posterburner.com slash AZP today, and you'll get an additional 10% off your order. That discount applies to every type of print they offer. Again, that's posterburner.com slash AZP. Hey, this is TC. And this is Jim from the Studio Demands It podcast. Where every episode we take a demand from a hypothetical studio. Which could be you. And challenge ourselves to conceptualize, pitch, and craft a film based on the stipulations. Or the demands. We are given. We talk about movies all the time. Particularly, we complain about the choices made in the films we've seen. We're nerds like that. And, of course, like any good nerd does, we automatically assume that we could do better. Even with the demands and restrictions that clearly must have been put on by a production. So head on over to studiodemandsit.com and listen to our previous library of episodes. Our library of previous episodes. Our precious library, Jim. <laughs> our library of precious episodes. <laughs> You're a pirate Smeagol. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So head on over to studiodemandsit.com to listen to our library of episodes. And submit your demand for a future episode, too. So go do that. Okay, bye. Okay, end of ad. And we are back from the break. Woo! Mm-hmm. <laughs> you want to... You, don't you just want to order a poster now, Kate? From posterburner.com slash AZP? Oh, 
Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> 10% off. I did not hear the ad in my own dining room, so nope. I was a little confused little, for a second little production there. magic here. Production <laughs> magic. Uh, yeah, yeah. But that is exciting. It is cool uh, yeah. that we have them as a sponsor. Very cool. Awesome. Um, and it's kind of funny. I've had a few people come to me and say, like, oh, I want to print out some artwork. And I'm like, well, actually. Hey, <laughs> funny you should say that. No, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to have that support and also all the support from our patrons. It's really nice. Um, so, Kate, let's go into characters. Yes. It's odd. I guess we accidentally did this episode in reverse. Usually I do characters first. A little bit, but... I just wanted to get into it in the beginning. Yeah. I want to ask you first off, because we've spoken to this point a few other times in other episodes. Mm -hmm. As I was playing the game this time around, I didn't want to assume, but I did have moments where I thought, I wonder if Kate's digging playing as like a cool girl character. If I may, can yeah. you, would you like to speak to that at all? Yeah, for sure. Um, I did. I did like that. She was, she's a strong woman in this game that, you know, she's in charge of um, these kids that um, are in the lighthouse with her. She is also, you know, skilled at combat. She's not just like, she doesn't have to be trained. She's already You're right. skilled at combat. You're so right. she just kind of, you know, automatically awesome yeah um i'm trying not to say like dirty words or anything like oh. that but she's like she's awesome she's bad butt right wow um she <laughs> she looks cool like she has a cool haircut she has green lipstick like the green lipstick was like very hip she's fashionable mm -hmm. um she doesn't take any crap um nope. she jokes around with Paige, and you know she seems very intelligent um, so yeah, I thought it was awesome to have like a strong female main character. We've joked that sometimes you'll dress Link up in, in the, uh, Gerudo clothes in Breath of the Wild sometimes just cause it's like, you just kind of like want to have that as the aesthetic. I just want to be a lady. You know, and, and we've, we're kind of hoping that hopefully maybe Zelda is a bit playable in Breath of the Wild too. We're not really sure. Yeah. It could be kind of cool, but it did strike me this time around. I was like, Ooh, I wonder, you know, cause we have had that conversation of that from that perspective. Now, well, let me ask you this. Uh, certainly in stark contrast to Zelda, our main character speaks. Yes. How do you feel about that? Uh, that was cool. I liked the voice acting in this game, actually. I mean, I even liked it better than some Legend of Zelda voice acting. I thought it was really well done. I thought so, too. The performances um, were good. Yeah, they really were. Um, like when she had that monologue? When the lighthouse breaks and yeah, she's talking to the dog? Yeah. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. And she's saying to the dog... I know you tried to save them. You tried to help them. But of course, she's obviously talking about herself. Mm -hmm. I had a little moment when that was going down. Yeah. She's I liked like, it. I know you tried to do it, but obviously you couldn't. You stupid. She's not really berating the dog, but she's like, right. How, why would you think that you could do something like this? And there's cinematic camera angles and music and her uh, her sidekick is, is upset for her. And yeah, I thought it was great. Not only does our main character speak during gameplay, but she has a literal monologue in this game. And I thought that was kind of cool yeah um oh i was gonna say also i like that jade is dressed uh in a way that makes sense she's not wearing like no clothes like right. female characters often are yeah um especially if they are involved in combat for some reason that often makes them wear less clothing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's man in logic games yeah that's but no logic. she has like big cargo pants or like mm -hmm. big big pants on and a jacket and um, yeah yeah i dig it yeah, super cool. I liked it too. The first time I played um, Beyond Good and Evil, I really liked Paige, the the pig, but I think it was just because I was excited that, that there was an, a Navi that was talking and living with me. Mm -hmm. I think I was more excited about that than other things because honestly, some of his dialogue is a little weird. On the second playthrough, I was less enthusiastic about Paige, to be honest. Yeah, um, I wasn't super heartbroken when he was not part of the game I know. anymore. Um, Even though Double H was a little weird, I, I was fine with him. I He was funnier yeah. because he was trying to be serious, whereas Paige's character was trying to be funny, and for that reason, it was not funny. It was a little bit of the creepy uncle thing. It, oh, he, he's he is her uncle, quote unquote. Right, but it was just forced i don't know yeah. um i no. didn't find the humor that that great but the other yeah with double h i was like oh this guy's funny because yeah. he's trying to be he kind of reminds me of like buzz lightyear where he takes himself very seriously but you kind of have to laugh at him because of that because he's clearly just kind of 
And it makes you wonder if right. he might be like that in real life a little bit. I'm sure he is. But also they built it into the narrative because you meet him after his, essentially his brain's been fried. So he's a little off. I right. like that they made his jaw a little crooked from the whole thing. And like, it, it was it was kind of funny as if he had just a touch of damage or something, you know, made his face be a little crooked. Yeah. I'm not joking about that. I, I like that guy. <laughs> um, I remember when it first switched from page to double H, the first time I played, I was kind of like, ooh, I don't know if I like double H what happened to the pig guy. But this time around, I mean, you actually play, I think, two-thirds of the game with double H than mm-hmm. you do with Paige. Paige, Paige had some really crappy one-liners, too, by the way. Yeah. They were like, as, mu- as much as we were speaking about Jade being perhaps prog- progressive, mm-hmm. some of his comments are, like, not great, honestly. Yeah, and he has um, fart shoes. Yes, that's true. So yeah, I wrote that down in my notes. I was like, fart shoes? Mm-hmm. Really? There's a, there's a weird thing with the... With the Beyond and Good, Beyond Good and Evil universe, and this is also, I think, kind of going to be realized in the sequel, where the pigs are just gross. Mm. There was a preview trailer of Beyond Good and Evil Two that came out five or six years ago of a version of a game that will not be released. They, they're totally redoing how it's going to work now. Mm-hmm. And he was like, Page was disgusting. He ate a fly through his nostril, like he he sucked it in and then swallowed it. Ew. It, he was gross. So I don't know where that humor is coming from, uh. but a little bit of that's even in this game. <laughs> I got my fart boots. Yeah, f- fart shoes. Woohoo. Um uh, they're shoes that allow him to do a super jump. They're like little rocket boots, but they're fueled by methane. Mm-hmm. Is what that is to, mm-hmm. to to be clear. Ha 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 farts. How did you feel about um what's his name? The uh the bald guy, the uh uh, I don't have his name up right now, but he's basically the, um, the Agents of Shield. He's basically like the guy that brings in D- Mr. DeCastellay or whatever oh, his yeah. name is. Um, yeah, I thought it was DeCastellet. super weird when I first played, and I'm, I roll up, and there's like a limousine and and a guy. I was like, what? I don't know if I'm into this at first, honestly. When I when I first met him, yeah, I had trouble. I think keeping track of all the various players in the story because oh, it really? seemed like there were. I think I was confused whether there were two or three main like groups of people. And I think what I got confused by is that is alpha sections. Like I thought that was a group of people or something. I think so. Um, And then the doms and then the Iris network. And it just got kind of too convoluted after a while for my taste. Um, I think there's four main factions, but it's uh, there's supposed to be, to, like on the surface, we have our normal authority, whatevers, and mm-hmm. that might be alpha sections. I think that's like the police or whatever. And technically, the main bad guy is there, but he's evil inside that because he's being controlled by the Doms. But on the surface, you have a town or a planet with its normal law enforcement being mm-hmm. invaded by aliens. Of course, one of the twists that we learn is that the aliens and the law enforcement on that planet are in in on it together. And Shocking. They're, they're faking. I know all the twists in this one, you know, beyond good and evil, the idea, the story, the idea of even the title is that it's not about just good guys and just bad guys is what they were going for. Mm-hmm. But to be honest, at the end of the day, I think it did get a little muddy and you kind of, you, some of these, if you have four different factions of the people that are rebelling against this, people rebelling against that, and then you have the obvious bad guys and the obvious good guys, but guess what? We're going to twist it and all of that. Um, at the end of the day, those twists came so early and so obvious that it did become just good guys and bad guys very quickly. Mm-hmm. It kind of reminded me of Star Wars in that way, I think. I think it so. starts off like seeming much more complicated than it actually is. Well, the famous thing about Star Wars is how the good guys are actually the bad guys if you're looking at the uh, at the uh, government. You know, yeah. They're literally the rebels. And then, okay, fine. Right, right. We're, they're going against the government, but the government's so bad because they've been infiltrated by, you know, all these other bad people in the past. It's a bit of that. Yeah. For me, I was not super, like, mind blown by some of the uh, reveals and some of the twists. It was fine. Yeah, including the de- Castellac, which I think they called him, like, du- Cadillac. Ha <laughs> ha, funny oh, really? joke at some point. Um, well, he ends up being kind of the main, the main guy. Right. He's the one in the orange sweater later on. What did I get to that part? I'm not going to lie. I did not finish the game. What? You got um, to the moon. I did not. Oh. Okay, let's talk about Drama it. Drama and intrigue. So the reason for this is that I got, and this is one of my main gripes about this game, I got so sick of collecting pearls yeah. that I just decided I was done. I know it. where you stopped then. It's You got to the point where you needed to get pearls to fly up to the moon, right? Exactly. I can speak to this because I almost stopped there too. And you're not missing much on the moon. You're missing a lot of 
the end boss fight's pretty good. I watched video, so yeah. I have seen it and I okay. know what happens, but cool, cool. That's fine. I actually, because the last time we t- spoke about this casually, you're like, I'm about to go to the moon. And I mm-hmm. thought, okay, she'll get there. But you're absolutely right. There's a point in this game where you have 20 pearls and you need almost 50 you need or something. 50. Right. To, to get the one thing to, to go to Ganon's castle, essentially, right? Mm-hmm. To get the key to Ganon's castle. The, that key is expressed as enough pearls to buy a warp, a uh, hyper engine, engine I think, or to get out like of that. the atmosphere of the planet. Right. Fine. There is, on the top of the volcano, there is a hidden stash of like 30 pearls. Mm. And I ended up, I did actually just kind of accidentally, I went there and got all those pearls. But if I hadn't have done that, I would have been nitpicking into all the little caves, yep. all the stupid little races, and I don't think I would have gotten it. No. And and honestly, with that that complete imbalance of where these pearls are, if you don't go to the top of the volcano and you go into that volcano and they're just everywhere. Basically, you fight um, critters in each one of them. You know the guys that kind of like go and they fly around at you and they yeah, scream yeah, yeah. at you? Yep. Every single one of them has a pearl in them oh. in this volcano. How so, convenient. Yeah, you're just going through wha- hacking and slashing and you're just like pearl, 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 pearl. And I got out of the volcano. I was like, okay, I have 50 pearls now. Ah. If I wouldn't have gone into the volcano, I think I would have had exactly your experience. Yeah, I think I ended up with like 30 and I needed 20 more or something like that. Like yep. I got part of it but not all of it and i was like this is not fun anymore the game breaks there a little bit the way wind waker when wind waker breaks it breaks in a similar way yeah um and actually something i read that's interesting on the wikipedia page for beyond good and evil is that they meant to have more exploration I'm but sure. because of wind waker they cut it down wait what because yeah because of the uh the negative kind of reception of all the sailing in wind waker that made the developers be like eh, maybe we don't have as much exploration so let's cut it down a little bit because it does seem truncated like the game seems smaller than you would think it should or could be yes um and i, mean, I the- guess that's yep. a main reason why I see. The ocean areas, the Hyrule fieldness of it. It's more like Hyrule Field than it is Wind Waker's Ocean. It's just, but you're on water. Right. Because it is like a solid loaded area. I mean, it probably loads little chunks, but it's not like this weird kind of never ending Wind Waker ocean thing. Right. But the, I mean, honestly, I like, I think the water's beautiful. I like all the little creatures and it feels like things are living there, which is definitely something Wind Waker doesn't have. Yeah. But um, the reason I... uh, say it's more like Hyrule Field is because at a certain point there's literal just fences around where you yeah. just can't go anymore. You can't go you can't go here. Right. Don't try to go here. Um and so I wonder now if the volcano thing that I experienced was just a quick fix. It was just like, okay, it was a mission that I got at the bar. It was like I talked to someone and they said, Hey, there's a secret volcano. Go to the volcano. Oh. Maybe I talked to the cow guy for it. Um went to the volcano and got twenty five pearls or whatever and I was like, okay, I guess I keep moving. And I honestly didn't do any of, I, did, I tried to do a couple of the um, smuggler races. I know that, the, you know, because mm-hmm. you can bring up your, in the maps, did you get, um, did you get the pearl finder thing? Did you buy it at the, there's the the walrus guy? Yeah, no, I did. I had the animal finder, I think. I did the animal finder as well, but I, I got the, the pearl, pearl finder. finder first. And so you can, uh, when you bring up your map, you can like uh, sort, visually sort uh, what you want to see. And I did use that a lot to get pearls, especially uh-huh. in the second half, to make sure I wasn't missing any. But when you look at it, there's just like little ones speckled all over the place, and mm-hmm. they're part of the races, or they're part of the whatever. Oh, man. It that's a real got, stopping point. Yeah, it just got too tedious, where I don't have that in right. Zelda games. It's like, it reminded me of Banjo-Kazooie, when you have to get all the puzzle pieces in order to play a level. Um, you have to be collecting these puzzle pieces in the other levels to be able to access further levels. Right. And I was like, eh, even in Banjo Kazooie, I remember. I mean, now I'm really good at playing it, but um, back in the day, I was like, okay, this is it's almost not worth it anymore. Right. Like, I just want to be able to play the game. Just let me play the game and let me advance in the game. So it made me frustrated. And so, yeah, I just ended up kind of cheating and watching videos I, it's okay it's okay and honestly once you go to the moon i was gonna have this conversation i didn't want to hate on it too much but the moon is um cinematically kind of exciting but game mechanic wise it is it it leaves one it leaves to be desired whatever the expression would be like mm-hmm. you get there and there's not a lot going on there's a lot of design and you kind of it feels like a broken dungeon. It feels like they had to finish it up. Ah. There are parts where you're walking around and you see all these other areas where you obviously could go and it's like, oh, you just go here. And it felt like um, there's a part where you get to the moon and you have to break the transmitters to get all the messages to Hillis or whatever. Mm -hmm. And 
you, you can feel that there's like three forced line of sight puzzles where you're moving lasers to make things activate. Mm-hmm. And it feels tacked on just so it feels like you're doing something. And there's a lot of, they make you backtrack a lot and run forward a lot. And then you go through some elevators and then it's the final boss. And also, once you get to the moon, you can't go back. Once you get to the moon, your space drive breaks down narratively. <laughs> like as you're flying around, they're like, what? Those mama goes, they gave us a bad want, bad drive. So you can't go back to Hyrule. You're stuck on the moon for the gameplay uh, to the end. I did read about that. Like it's I not read, cool. uh, yeah, you better be ready to just put the rest of the game away if mm-hmm. you want to go to the moon, which I did also write down. I kind of had to laugh a little bit every time they were very seriously talking about they're sending these people to the moon. To the moon. I'm like, really, of all the places, <laughs> like, and they called it the moon. They didn't even say like our moon, our moon or they didn't give the moon a name. Yep. You know, like there's Hillis and then the moon is called blah 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 is this earth's moon like what is happening yeah, the moon mm-hmm. like what <laughs> they're sending yeah. people to the moon mm-hmm. anyway it was just the the little the iris network that was fine the little hiding mm-hmm. spot where they would check out their stuff that was kind of cool it's something we hadn't seen in a zelda game I, I guess you do get it in twilight princess a little bit though if you think about it over yeah. in Thomas bar yep it's a little bit less expressed but it's similar mm-hmm. um um Oh, another thing I wanted to say about the pearls is that, okay, fine. The pearls, I think they had an identity crisis with these pearls because, cool, they're all the little things. So in Breath of the Wild, when you're collecting Koroks or you're collecting, what's another thing you need? The shrines, I guess, even. Let's just say that. The shrines to get more hearts and stuff. Um, They're all balanced for the most part. Um, you know, when you co- when you're collecting Korok seeds, you get so many, okay, you need 40 more for the next sword slot, whatever, mm-hmm. and it, it grows at a good level. The pearls are very unbalanced. And what I mean by that is you might work really hard to get one pearl. Mm -hmm. And then when you finish the slaughterhouse, quote unquote, dungeon, a door opens up and they're like, here's 15 pearls. Yeah. And you're like, wait, what? I I didn't even do it. You just click and it goes. Yep. And you got 15 more pearls. And you're like, oh, these aren't, this isn't a collection quest. These are just, this is just a janky version of doing keys. Yes. They might as well have just given you another key or something. Right. And you don't know until you do it. Right. You might be working at something forever and it's like, oh, I get one pearl. Great. Mm-hmm, I'm mm-hmm. not that much closer to getting to the moon. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was a little that was a little. So a little bit of a Wind Waker crisis with this game. It starts off yeah. strong and then it, it does leave some to be desired. Yeah, it started off strong. I really enjoyed like getting into the, well, not getting into the slaughterhouse. That was a whole nightmare. But once you get. That was with get, the hovercraft, right? Y- yeah. Yeah. Once you get in there, like I liked the the different levels. There were only, I mean, there's only there were only like what three or four. Maybe? If these locations are considered dungeons, which we can debate in a minute, uh-huh. if they're considered dungeons, there's basically three dungeons in this game, and that's it. And that's actually it. Then you go to the moon. Yeah, and I mean they're they're fun, and that's great. Mm-hmm. But then it just peters out so much after that when it's like you ah 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 you can't go to the moon unless you have all of these. You're right. That's what it is. It's an uh uh uh. It's not like oh okay we just got to get that one thing Mm -hmm. you go from 20 you know 30 pearls or whatever to needing 50 and it's such a large jump that that's not something to be accomplished it's a it's like a demerit it's like oh you get hit with it Uh Mm uh-huh um Completely separate note, if we want to go away from the pearls briefly sure. here, I did think it was cool to see um, there's so many different like cultures and creatures and races in this game. Like everyone's different and everyone's yep. living together and they all want to want to live together in harmony. Yes. And, you know, I thought that was really cool to see. I did not love the Jamaican accent um, yeah. situation going on. I don't know how appropriate that was necessarily. Yeah. I think 15 years ago, it might have been a little bit more palatable, but I certainly sure. noticed it as well. Sure. Um, but I did like that, you know, the, these were all sorts of different people like mm-hmm. living together. Yeah, there's a lot of anthropomorphized, I think yes. I just got tongue-tied there, but um, characters where you have rhinoceroses and, and I don't know, monkeys and, and all these things. And each of the different animals become vague stereotypes for certain cultures in America, but, or not America, on the planet. Mm-hmm. And it was okay, though, because I feel like what they were doing was... They were just at least referencing things to be familiar. So, you know, like, you know, when you go to the walruses shop, it's very Asian influenced and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, the rhinos are very Jamaican influenced. <laughs> uh-huh. And other animals have different influences, too. Now, if 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 that's just, you know, be it as some people are comfortable with anthropomorphized animals. Some people aren't. Why are there also humans? 
I think in Beyond Good and Evil 2, they're going to speak to that a little bit. Oh. But um, in this version, you just kind of go with it. You're like, okay, this is the fantasy we're in. What they're really trying to say here is what you just said, Kate, is that it's many different cultures. They're trying to give it the idea of all these mixed um, cultures living together and make the world feel bigger, which yeah. is kind of cool. Yeah, I liked it. It, mm-hmm. was, it was a cool little extra touch where I was like, oh, they're all like, everyone's different, but everyone is all hanging out at the bar together. And, you know, they're all trying to fight the same fight. It's a little bit Star Wars that way, but instead of aliens, they're using animals. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of cool. Breath of the Wild scratches that by having the different towns and the Yiga and the Sheikah and like it scratches that a little bit, but doesn't, it's not a fully realized thing. Right. But I I agree with you. I think that was kind of cool. Again, that world building, like there was so much world building happening i just needed more game but it's okay yeah yep so uh we're starting to get to the end of the episode here um i wanted to uh talk about some other mechanics how'd you feel about the map mechanic i found it a touch frustrating if i may yeah so are you talking about um basically you can kind of use a compass is that or you're well, talking about oh the me, map it's within like, the there's dungeon? no mini map and oftentimes i turn the mini map off anyway in games but there is not a mini map on the screen right to go to the map you have to push pause Bring your analog stick to to lower left, right, mm. then go into the map, and then you kind of get a vague representation of what you're in. Yeah, and then you, you kind of zoom in and zoom out. I thought it was just a touch. I thought that whole radial thing was kind of cool at first, but it got a little chunky. I basically didn't use it at all. The map? Yeah. Really? I think unless I was like, you know, am I any closer to getting to the thing that I needed to take a picture of? Yeah. I really wasn't using it um, because of what you said. Like the the whole item selection in general was pretty tedious. Like you had to get through things by going, you know, pausing the game and then going into your gear bag yeah. and then choosing something. I did kind of like that you could um, give your sidekick items. Yeah. I thought that was a cool little extra thing. Like you can give them more hearts, which takes away from you. So there's a little strategy involved in that. Yeah. And that was cool. Um, and I also really like the password entry system I did too. with the scrolling. It's kind of like a spiral staircase of letters and numbers that you can scroll through and it's easily navigable. Like you, it, I liked it aesthetically so much more than like a keyboard right. looking thing. It was very smart. It was very cool. Um, so that I liked, but and you just, um, cause you just crank around like almost like a steering wheel and you can pick your things very fast, letters, yep. numbers, and it's a three dimensional thing where the spiral is going, you're going in and out of a spiral. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's very intuitive and quick. It was kind of like, how did you put so much effort into this and not <laughs> other things? But yeah. like, even so that was pretty cool. Yep, yep, yep. Um, and I liked that. I, I don't think you had to use the, all of the passwords in the exact quote unquote right place. Like I think towards the end of the game before the moon, you could maybe put them in different, like use a different password in different areas. All the passwords meant different things and they weren't always just for the same thing. And some you could get just casually. Some were puzzles. Like I thought it was kind of cool. The guy that would cover up with his hand, the password in the restaurant. And if you realize if you go up on the balcony and zoom in with your camera, you can take a picture of it. Oh, that's how you get that password. I, that's not how I got that password. I just kept talking to, or, uh, kept talking to him. And at first I think he moves his hand back. Back, and then oh. I just looked <laughs> really cool. And I wrote it down. Oh, so, neat. Yeah, I kind of so I walked up on way. the balcony and then zoomed in with a camera. So oh. he didn't have his hand there, he didn't like notice that I was there, kind of thing. Well, that's a cool little. I thought the passwords were all things considered pretty cool. And when they have to send you passwords, like I scanned the thing, and it's obviously their version of like the locked door in Zelda, like, <laughs> but they do it with like, uh uh-uh, uh, Shawnee, you got to go get your stuff. Yeah, and then I'll give you the code. That was a little on the nose, but it was fine. Yeah, um, um. Um, the camera, the item selection. So either yeah. you go into your start menu and you have to get it clunkily out of your box, but they did try to, at least with your digital left and right, you could swipe through items on your, for me, it was the X button, mm-hmm. you know, my X on GameCube, but it was a little too, f- so if you did digital left or right, you could just go bloop, 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 and move your items and then change your action buttons. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Which was kind of nice. I accidentally ate so many <laughs> like too. health cookies, basically. Uh-huh. K-Bups. K-Bups. A K-Bub restores your energy. I hate that. Like That after- was the whole French thing. Oh, okay. If I may, I, I deduce the kind of, because I'm, I'm referencing it, it was very Fifth Element style of like, here's the, it's like making a comment on how much culture or pop culture wasn't fitting it. You know what I mean? It's like the, 
it's the total recall thing. It's the soda machine that's just too nice to you. Even oh, okay. though th- you know what I mean? It's that. Yeah. That that could have been done with, you know, two thirds of the way through the game. Like, I know what the K Bobs are. How many times did I hear like, okay, bub, boom, okay, bub, boom, okay, bub, <laughs> yeah. restores your energy. I know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I definitely accidentally ate a lot of health that I did yeah. not mean to eat because I wasn't flipping through my items in the correct way. Yeah. So that was, that was a little frustrating. Um, but I do feel that it was a valid attempt at. You know the 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 horrible thing about like uh, playing a Game Boy Zelda game is pausing and going in and out and in and out just to put your items yes, down. Yes. Yes. I think this was their version of trying to get around that. Like you can hot swap your items while you're playing, and I think Star Fox Adventures did a version of that too, where you could cycle through things. Mm-hmm. I think they did it with the Z button, but but I digress. Um, ultimately, it kind of worked for me, kind of didn't, but I just wanted to note that it was a valid attempt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Any final thoughts about Beyond Good and Evil? And then I just want to do Beyond Good and Evil 2 for just five minutes. Yeah, I mean, I... Would you agree that it's a Zelda-like? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, And it's hard to kind of like give it, because I know we've given games like letter grades in the past. It's hard, Mm. it's kind of hard to do that now because I feel like, you know, looking at the reviews that existed when it first came out, it would be different than playing it now. Like right now, I kind of want to give it like a C. Right. But back then I may have wanted to give it an A, you mm-hmm. know, just because of what you were saying, all the new things, you know, that it was doing for yeah. the for the time that it came out in 2003. Um, unfortunately, I was not aware of this game in 2003. Um, I, I likely would have played it if I had known what it was about because I'm like, yeah, this totally seems like my kind of game. Mm-hmm. I just felt like there was something missing like the the story was there and that you know they had the plot there um they had the characters there they had a really good main character yep um i i do wish they had had more levels or dungeons i wish there was more overworlds to explore there's a bit of a skyward sword feeling to me with this one it's like oh we have three areas Mm -hmm. the thing about Skyward Sword is that you have your dungeons, but also the areas are very complicated, so they're kind of puzzly too, which was kind of cool about Skyward Sword is that you weren't mm-hmm. just running across the field. You actually had to solve puzzles just to get to the dungeons. Mm-hmm. But in, in Beyond Good and Evil, and certainly Skyward Sword came out after Beyond Good and Evil, Beyond Good and Evil, the dungeon, the area or the dungeon was very gray. I wouldn't, you know what I mean? The mm-hmm. If we were to say like the factory or the slaughterhouse or whatever is a dungeon, it's an enormous dungeon. Yeah. It's actually really big. Yes, it would, it's almost more like going to Snow Peak and then also doing the dungeon right. Twilight Princess or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, I kind of wish there were more l- smaller ones. Yeah, I see. I guess. There still were boss battles and things, boss yeah. battles in the middle of some of these dungeons and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Some of these areas. I didn't, um, the combat was fine. I don't even remember yeah. that. It's really just push A. There's not much more to it. Yeah. She has that, that warm up thing, which is kind of cool. Yeah. And then you use your sidekicks and you can oh. shoot your discs. Yeah. The warm up thing is exactly just Link's well, yeah, sword. Yeah. You know, it's it, the mechanics yeah, yeah. are all there. Yep. Um, but they're just. You know, I'm I'm so used to using my bow and arrow and my slingshot and my hookshot and using different things to defeat things in different ways. And it was missing that. Oh, my gosh. You're right. There are not any special items to help you move forward. No, it's really just that disc launcher, which reminded me of like. I mean, I know the game came out in early 2000s, but I was like, this is so 90s, like a pew, 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 like shooting pogs (laughs) or something like what is this? Yeah. Um, But yeah. I, you know, I, I did like the characters. I really like the voice acting. So there are good things, there are bad things. And it was certainly a, an awesome game to just play to for playing sake, to play it yeah. for the first time. Um, so it was cool. I liked it. It's not my favorite game, but I, I did like... I, I definitely want, like the beginning and middle. Yeah, I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, but... You know, one of the reasons we are doing some of these Zelda-like games is to speak to how Zelda has informed the game industry as as its games come out. Mm Because I feel that stuff like Beyond Good and Evil, even by accident, is a direct response to, not even response, but influenced by, I I would say, Ocarina of Time, even more than Wind Waker. Mm -hmm. Like these people would play Ocarina of Time and six, seven years later, they wanted to make a game. They had their own ideas, but whether they like it or not, it's like making a platformer. If you play Mario, you want to make your own platformer, right? right? So I think that these are acts of love when these companies make essentially Zelda-likes for the most part. They called it Hillis. I mean, (laughs) come on, come on. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's true. Um, Then last but not least, 
are there any aspects of this game that you prefer to any other Zelda games? Is there anything this game did where you're like, ooh, that's something a Zelda game hasn't done, and I liked it? Did they bring anything new to the table? Maybe the, they tried with the story. They tried to make the story really dramatic. Um, but I think I think there's other Zelda, you know, Zelda, there's other Zelda stories that are better. Mm-hmm. They tried to improve the item mechanic thing, but there just weren't that many items to use. I mean, I don't. I don't know if this is even realistic, but I do like when there's a lot of good voice acting in a game. Yeah. I, I don't I, I don't mind reading a bunch of mm-hmm. text. But sometimes in Zelda, the text is like overwhelming. You're like, okay, I get it. Yeah, especially if you play the game already. You're like, I know, you're I know, I know. scrolling through a paragraph of text and you can only see a sentence at a time. It's like, boo, 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 boo. Which I guess could be a thing too for voice acting if you're like, I just want to skip this scene. So maybe if there were like more voice acting, but an option to skip the mm. scene. And I mean, obviously that takes work. It takes more people, you know, to actually be in their recording. Um, but I did really like that as part of this game. I was surprised how much there was. Yeah. And for the time, that was an aggressive amount of voice acting. Yeah, I mean, that in I recognize. Ga- in world voice acting. There's times where uh, Jade's running along and it triggers her to say something like, oh, they're taking him off on ships or something. Yeah. That was very new when yeah. this game came out, that kind of stuff. I mean, I was even impressed with that stuff now. Yeah. Because even in newer games, especially like newer indie games, there's just not... What you read everything. I mean, isn't this fascinating? What we're seeing now is we're seeing a game like Uncharted being influenced by games like Beyond Good and Evil, which was influenced by games like Ocarina, and it's an mm-hmm. entire. And I would not say that Uncharted games are Zelda likes, not at all. They're they're something else. But um, but isn't that interesting how that goes? Mm-hmm. So that would be something. Maybe the the fact that the camera the camera that Jade uses in this game is is much more useful than like the camera in. Wind Waker, in my opinion, yeah. like it, it legitimately helped her because that's a way you can get pearls is taking pictures of animals. And the more pictures you take, you yep. get pearls. So it was like useful and important to the story as opposed to just like a kind of side quest that you don't have to do. Yeah. I used the Kinstone strategy on this playthrough. I took pictures of every animal I could. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to go for it. The first time I played, I was like, this is, I don't like this. I don't need this. But this time I was like, let's do it. it and was, I got almost all of them. Yeah, it was more rewarding. It was like, oh, mm-hmm. I get something for this. So thing, you're positively reinforcing me. Yeah, it's true. And one thing that was kind of clever and fun is that even the monsters you fight are animals that you should take pictures of. Yeah. So sometimes like some creature comes out and you're like, wait, just hold on a second. <laughs> Trying to take a picture before you fight Beautiful, it. beautiful. Just hold it right there. <laughs> gorgeous, gorgeous. Yeah. That, oh my gosh. That would have been something maybe Zelda could have done better. I would say this, but yeah, I think, I think you've touched on something and I I would say that the one thing that it did very nicely, perhaps nicer than some other Zelda games, was the that presentation was was solid. the The graphics were very, you know, all the extra effort of having all these extra weird flowers growing and like you said uh, with Beyond Good and Evil, you start to it's for me when I was playing it, you forget about the graphics a little. You forget about the sides of the polygons and the edges, which finally happened also with Twilight Princess for me. Mm-hmm. But compared to Wind Waker and certainly Ocarina and stuff like that, they did a really good job of having you forget about the graphics and start to get immersed in the world, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As much as they could, they made sh- things round. They made things kind of goofy shapes and stuff like right. that. And I think there's something to be said for that. Not just pointy. Yeah. Yeah, so there's good presentation there, I think. Yeah. All right, so last but not least, Beyond Good and Evil 2. So for the past decade or two, uh, people have wanted a sequel to this game. Yeah. And it's been almost done, happened like two or three times already. Finally, Ubisoft, and it's the same studio, by the way, that did the original. Mm -hmm. uh, They they greenlit a true Beyond Good and Evil sequel. And honestly, they started working on it three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. It first debuted in 2017 on an E3. And then they had an update trailer, an update trailer. And now there's, if you Google right now, you can find gameplay and stuff like that. Um, It is ambitious, to say the least. Hey, do you know much about this game? No, just exactly basically what you said is that as of 2017, it was like officially a go. Do you um, know about the game No Man's Sky? I do not. I think I think Bill was playing it for a while. We fly, you can fly in and out of, uh, can go to a planet, fly up into the atmosphere, fly to other planets, like the entire mm-hmm. planet is living. Um, quick version of this with the Beyond Good and Evil 2 is Ubisoft will say, um, they are creating a persistent online world not even world, but but universe. Maybe mm-hmm. not universe, but at least galaxy. 
and there's going to be many planets and all the planets are going to have all these different towns on them and cities, living cities that people, all of them, everyone goes into this almost World of Warcraft style dynamically and they have cultures and all these different characters and they have different economic classes. Wow. And people will just kind of go live and play inside these areas. There's also a thing where Joseph Gordon-Levitt's company, um, Play It First or whatever it was called, I can't remember what it was called. Um, people are people in the real world are submitting their artwork to be assets in these in this game. It's wow. it's going to be enormous. Huh. And honestly, I hope they pull it off because it could be a lot of fun. It could be really cool. Yeah. But also, there was a lot of promise with Beyond Good and Evil, and it puttered out, didn't it? Yeah. So like, I hope we get it though. They've been working on this one for three four years. Um, Jade, there's a trailer I wanted to show you, but we're getting a little bit tight on time, so I think I won't. I'll just send it to you to take a look at. Yeah. Um, you don't play as Jade. You play as your own person who gets their own ship, but it's in the same. It's still it's canonically the universe, and there is a trailer. There's a cinematic trailer that I'll share with you later, maybe on text or something. I see it here. Where Jade does show up, so Jade will be part of the universe. Ooh. But honestly, I think in that trailer she shows up with some uh, Domsey Alpha sections as her guards. So I don't know if maybe she's been uh, assimilated into the doms in this narrative. I hope not. I don't think so. But I it's saw a cool something little trailer. That, that it might be a prequel or is supposed to be a prequel. So maybe that's that blows my mind. Has something to do. There with was it. a time where they were going to make a prequel. Oh, so maybe so maybe not anymore. Yeah, I think this gotcha. one is because in the cinematic trailer that came out, the, it's like the second most recent one. Mm-hmm. Um, Paige is basically in it, mm-hmm. and he sees her, and it ends with a very dramatic like Jade. You know, like he's, he hasn't seen her in decades or years oh, at least okay. kind of thing. Gotcha. So it could be cool. We'll see. This game will not be a Zelda-like. This game is more like a World of Warcraft-like or something like that. Okay. I don't know. It's it's really... But one thing that's kind of cool about Beyond Good and Evil 2 is just like how Beyond Good and Evil really pushed the edge of video game language, what you could do at the time, things that were jaw-dropping like changing the camera angles, mm-hmm. uh, having the graphics be certain ways, having p- characters talk while you walk past them. Mm-hmm. That's all normal now. But um, at the time, that was very ambitious. Maybe this team will bring something. Awesome. Well, you know, I will look forward to it and I will give it a shot. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. I, I'm much more excited about them. At first, I thought it was kind of a... Uh, I felt a little betrayed. I was like, you're just using the Beyond Good and Evil... IP to make your open world, everyone in it, mm. Warcraft game. And maybe they are a little bit, but everything I see, it seems like aesthetically, economically, the way the way Beyond Good and Evil explored different tiers of society, even mm-hmm. if it was all just smoke and mirrors and stuff we were just seeing mm-hmm. while we played that the game we just played, it feels like they're trying to realize that in this game. So we'll see. Awesome. Cool. Is this game, before we say goodbye, better than any Zelda game you've played? Would this win over any of the 25 Zelda games that are out there? Would you rank any Zelda games lower than this game if you had to? Sometimes that's comparing apples to oranges, though, depending on, like, the system. Let's talk about any of the 3D Zelda games, then. Uh, no. (laughs) Right. I feel the same. I would say no. I feel the same. Mm Mm-hmm. Cool. Cool. So a nice exercise here into yeah. exploring what makes a Zelda game, what doesn't, how Zelda games have influenced people, and uh, maybe there are little things like uh, this game had her dodge button, her jump and roll dodge, mm-hmm. and later in Skyward Sword, Link had a dodge, a jump dodge. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. happened. You know, so it's interesting. We'll see. I like it. I definitely see the connection, and I appreciate you bringing up this game so that I could play something new and different, too. Cool, cool, cool. Awesome. I don't know what the next Zelda-like will be. It'll be a year from now. Right now, we're diving into A Link to the Past. Oh, boy. All right, Kate. Well, I'll see you. I think we might have a guest episode coming up next. I have the schedules moving around a little bit. But I'll see you in a couple episodes to talk all about uh, the making of Ocarina of Time. But mm-hmm. we might have, I think you might be doing a favorite side quest of Twilight Princess episode first. Indeed. It would be great. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. See you then. Later, Kate. Okay, bye. Bye.